I am so excited because my next guest is a scientist and executive director of the Kinsey Institute. If you're not familiar with the Kinsey Institute, they are the world-class leading researchers when it comes to sexuality, research, and well-being. Hey, Dr. Justin, how are you? Hi, Michelle. It's great to be here with you. Thanks. I'm so excited to be talking about a topic that post-pandemic, I think we're going to see a boom in, which is sex. And mm -hmm. today it's really, really interesting because we've spent a year approximately in yeah. lockup and people have had to really adopt to technology when in terms of finding love, creating romantic connections. Can you share with me a little bit about what you guys are seeing in terms of research? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. And um, so very early on in the pandemic, we launched a large multinational study. So we collected information from people all over the world on what was happening in their uh, intimate lives. It was called Sex and Relationships in the Time of COVID. Oh. And a team of researchers from the Kinsey Institute um, got together and we thought, well, this is a natural experiment playing out. And what can we understand about what's going on? And what we found in that initial study was that early on in the pandemic, people's frequency of sexual behavior was actually declining. So although really? I think a lot of, yeah, and I think a lot of people thought, well, you're going to be home with your boo and you'll be there for the weekend and um, you'll be humping but, like bunnies. Yeah. <laughs> and, but what happened is as that turned into weeks and months, um, what we think that was going on is the stress, right? Of um, the way I always uh, like to think of it, as I say, two gazelles don't mate in front of a lion, right? So <laughs> <laughs> our mating psychology is not, um, really set up to respond to really high stress situations because you want to get out of that situation. Sort of mating requires some sense of safety uh, and comfort. Um, and that's true across the animal kingdom, including in humans. So the stress of what was going on with COVID, I think was too much. So we saw these declines in sexual frequency, declines in quality of sex life. So the story of sex uh, in COVID was not necessarily a great one. Actually, people were reducing their sexual activity, I think because of the stress, but in another finding, we found that a majority of people in relationships, their relationships were getting better during COVID, over 80% so that the relationship had stayed the same or improved. And I, I would imagine that that had to do with the fact that for those couples that were in quarantine and probably hadn't spent a lot of time with one another, they were able to really like focus on one another. They were able maybe to play games, do things that they probably wouldn't be able to do had the world been open and functioning as it normally would. Uh, you nailed it. I think that's exactly it. And I think you, you're so good at thinking about when we put people together, how the, what those opportunities are for connecting. And, and you're exactly right. That's what people were doing in their relationships. They were, uh, in many ways, it was like um, light coming in through the cracks. If you had a relationship that had problems, those problems were suddenly really bad. And that's yeah. what the data shows us. But if you had a relationship that was OK, you suddenly are turning to your partner and saying, you know, you really are supportive. You really do listen. Mm -hmm. Or we've never had this conversation, but we can have it now because we're in the house for three weeks. <laughs> so re relationships on the for the most part were doing well, despite these decreases in sex. And we know that sex, sexual satisfaction and relationship satisfaction are very tightly correlated in all the major studies. So even despite the sort of sex problems, or maybe problems isn't the right word, the sort of difficulties so many people had, the relationships were weathering the storm. Wow. You know, I and it's so interesting because post the 1918 flu, that's what the era post that became known as the Roaring Twenties, right? where mm -hmm. it just became a feeding frenzy when it came to sex. Um, now we're in 2020, complete different era, complete different generation. And we're seeing a lot more in regards to artificial intelligence and uh, dating and sexual relationships. You know, I, I believe the term that I was reading was digisexuals, am I right? Yeah. Yeah, digisexuals refer to people um, It's one class of people and sometimes terms like uh, aerobotics are used and uh, digital sexualities and digisexuals are people who their sexual attractions um, really focus in on the technological aspects, the devices, the robots, the artificial intelligence. Um, I think you're right. Something's going on. We're going to see this um, rise. I think there's two parts of that story. One is technology has been integrating into people's romantic and sexual lives for the last few decades. Mm -hmm. 
Um, in our big study we do with Match.com, we've been doing for 10 years collecting data on singles. Um, online dating, apps, websites, it's the most common way people meet today. It's, yep. it's the, um, and that's been just steadily increasing. And it's here to stay. Let's, let's, I just, think it's here let's, to stay. Just, let's just say it, it's here to stay. Yeah, it's totally here to say it. That doesn't mean people are always equipped with the tools of doing it effectively and that we can kind of talk a little bit about how to biohack um, using those technologies. Ooh. But but I think they're here to stay. Um, and we know that uh, in all sorts of aspects of our lives, technology is, is a part of sex and relationships. That's true of every age group, of every race and ethnicity, every religion, every continent on the globe. People are using technologies to find partners, to connect with partners, to maintain relationships. In some cases, the technologies are the source of the relationship, like with robots and artificial intelligence. So I think there's there's so much ground to cover. I love the way you framed it, right? When we think about the roaring 20s, what are we about to experience? What's this? What's the boom mm -hmm. that we might be in for in the years to come as we kind of reintegrate into society, all of us, uh, with each other. Yeah, it, it's kind of crazy because as a matchmaker, I'm, I'm talking to singles who are looking for love connections. And I think more and more during the actual pandemic, there were still people who were using that time to be like, you know what? I really want to find a relationship. I feel better about dating because I don't have the pressure of having to go home with someone. I don't feel the pressure of having to meet them. Like I can actually build and forge this relationship. And I find that so interesting that now as I'm talking to singles, as we're getting ready to open up and get back to some sense of normality of how things used to be, the conversation that I'm hearing from people is when it comes to sex is, how do, how do I know if it's safe for me to be sexually sexual with that person? How do I bring that up? Mm -hmm. And as you said, technology has become more and more integrated in our lives, um, which leads me to ask you a question around, you, you talked about that the people who are digisexuals are really, really into the technology piece of it. Could that mm -hmm. also be possibly some reasons as to why certain people may be just serial online daters and they never want to take the conversation from the online dating platform offline yeah oh sure and i think um i have a question for you i want to ask about that as well um uh, i think that's absolutely the case right so that there can be some people who enjoy the platforms it's what we sometimes in the behavioral sciences we call the gamification of dating mm -hmm. and that in some ways some of the platforms make it like a game and it can be fun to swipe or to chat um you know, I think the work so far on digisexuals has sort of looked more at um, more at almost ro robotics and artificial intelligence. So mm -hmm. ramping up from what I think most people think about as integration of technology, certainly things like um, online dating apps, but also even video dating. You know, the, I think one of the most interesting things that come out of COVID in, in terms of people's dating lives is the rise of video dating. Yeah. And the, the platforms now, a lot of them have a button you can hit to video chat. Um, we found that 69% uh, of people in our sample of 5,000 singles said that they um, learned a lot about someone video dating, they want to do it again. Half said that they think they can fall in love on a video date. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that's what people are saying. I think it's interesting. You know, I'm a biologist, so I'm so interested in the sensory experience of dating. When you hear someone's voice, you see their body language, you smell them, you feel them. Um, that's important to the courtship process for humans. But I think video dating is a step between just chatting and going on a kind of IRL in real life date. You get more sensory information for the brain. You see the artwork, you see the body language, how they dress, hear their voice. Um, so I'm convinced video dating uh, is here to say. So I'm curious what you also are seeing in your work as, uh, with people in terms of the concerns about going on these dates. I think, as you pointed out, the one big thing is, you know, is it safe and do we wear a mask or do we distance? But um, uh, for people who wanted to do that, to just chat on the apps, they kind of had an opportunity because you didn't have to get off of it. Right. And I, I worry, what do we what do we as researchers, as you as a matchmaker, how do we encourage people to um, go on those dates now in safe ways? Yeah, so a couple of things. I think when I'm talking to singles and I, and I literally have had, and it's really interesting because what I'm noticing is that it's really regional in North mm. America, meaning that the clients that I've been working with, if it's someone who's on the West Coast, they're really more apprehensive about meeting someone in real life. And as a vaccine actually also rolls out and, and mm -hmm. people get vaccinated, I find that people on the West Coast are a little bit more apprehensive. So it, they're more 
open to having maybe one, two or three virtual dates before actually meeting in person. Now on the East Coast, and it also depends what area, um, people are like, listen, the weather's great here, like in South Florida, the weather's great. I'll, I'm happy to do like more of a social distancing date, but I find that women tend to want to actually do a virtual date or a phone call first. That's what they're really comfortable. And I, and I saw that it, particularly for me as a matchmaker, I saw that being something as a norm prior to COVID, believe it or not, because yeah. people and women at, specifically were telling me and telling us that they were tired of the ghosting. They were tired of sending the phone number or the guy didn't ask for the number. So why am I going to continue to pursue him? If he's interested, he should give me the phone number. So now that I found that I'm still having these conversations now that we're about to be in a post pandemic world, um, I find that women and men on the East Coast, particularly, they're more like, listen, I am open to an in-person date, but I want to be able to find out whether that person practices safety protocols, whether or not they're, how they feel about the vaccine. Are they going to get in line to get a vaccine? Because that's going to play into whether or not I'm actually going to even give them the time of day. So the conversations that we're seeing are being more honest, more straightforward and direct, which I think is empowering. But I also think if something that we all learned throughout this entire year of being on lockdown is that there is no more, there is no other precious gift than the gift of time and what you do with it really truly matters. And, you know, we all have a limited amount of time on this earth. So yeah. what are you going to focus on? What are you going to dedicate it to? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and speaking on, on, on lockdown and, you know, virtual dates, there was an interesting conversation that came up with one of my clients and that is that she met a guy, she was in New York. She met this really great guy online and he was actually in Florida and they did virtual dating for like a couple of virtual dates. This was in, in the, in the midst of like the height of COVID. So they kept, they had no choice but to do virtual dates, FaceTime. They would talk on the phone every day. And then there came a point, they reached about the four week mark talking to one another, where he proposed to potentially maybe have a digital sexual experience virtually. Interesting. Yeah. I'm really curious to know in your yeah. research, what did, have you guys done any samples, any testing on that? Is it becoming more normalized? How, what are, what are the, the sentiments around virtual sex yeah oh i love that i love and i love um i love uh hearing kind of what people are doing in their in their lives i think it really informs the questions we need to ask as scientists and how we apply it mm -hmm. um uh, that's that's great and actually we are seeing that in our data so in our one uh, big study where we had about uh, four thousand people early in the pandemic um we did see that about one in five people added to their sexual repertoire during COVID. so they were expanding the behaviors they were doing and then when we looked carefully about what those were, um, they were actually more vanilla than I think people think. You know, it wasn't this a wild new behavior. It was people were um, trying sex toys sometimes for the first time, but a lot of them were doing things like sexting their partner, sending sexual images and messages, or doing exactly what you described, like having a sort of distant sexual encounter. Um, and there's all sorts of ways that that can um, look, right, in right. different people's lives. Sometimes it's with sexting. We've done a lot of work on sexting at the Kinsey Institute uh, with my colleagues, looking at sort of these uh, ways that we send images. Um, one important part is whether they're uh, solicited or not. So we know a lot of men will send genital images, uh, you know, so-called dick pics. Yeah. Um, and when they're unsolicited, it was a really interesting study with uh, my colleagues, Amanda Gesselman and Alexa Marcotte. And what we found was that on average, men were sending these images. Um, and if you ask them why, they, to both to men, to women, heterosexual men, and to gay men. If you ask them why, when they sent them, they said, oh, because I was asked for it and because it's fun and it's flirtatious and it'll turn them on. And then when we oh. ask heterosexual women why they get them, I know your facial reaction says everything. You're like these guys, right? <laughs> That's and not what I hear on my end. That's why. <laughs> exactly. So we asked the heterosexual, heterosexual women, why did you, uh, when, how did you react when you got them? And the most common responses was grossed out, disrespected, um, so it's what we call a sexual misperception bias, that the gender is sometimes, um, they think they're, they're doing something or something's wanted and the other gender um, doesn't, right? It's just sort of a, a total misunderstanding of this right. being okay. 
It's the conversation or the story they tell themselves, right? It's like, oh, this person likes me, they're into me. If we were in a normal scenario where we were around one another, we would be able to kiss and feel each other. And so maybe, and I don't know, maybe they process it like, well, since we can't do that, this is the next best thing. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And they're kind of just missing, missing the mark on comfort with it. And that, so that's one area that people are doing their sexting. Um, and then I think uh, to the question, uh, I think for your client was, there's sort of a ramp up of that, right? So then there are some people who are doing, there's what's called teledildonics. So there's sex toys that you can sometimes control. You can use them over a device, like a, oh. like a video chat. Um, so imagine, some people are familiar with this in movies or things, but they're, they're real products. It's um, like a vibrator or a sex toy that you can oh, control. Oh, like the ones that you put, like an underwear, where I've seen no. in the movies, and then a guy can no. control it from like a distance, and it's kind of like this whole turn on thing when they're at dinner or at a friend's party. It's like a, it's like a <laughs> sense of control kind of thing, if you will. Yeah, for some people. I mean, it's not... Um, some people will wear it in that sense. Others will use them more for a sexual like event. Like, you know, let's say, okay, we're gonna put the light, turn the lights on, put the candles on, put music. We're both gonna be on our video. And then um, in some ways having sex together. Um, and then for others, you're right. It's almost a little bit more of an exhibitionist um, experience. You're gonna be out to dinner and uh, you know, I think you have to be cautious of that if you're right. <laughs> <laughs> like in the movies, right? Um, but there's people who are using those sorts of products, integrating them into their sexual life. They're not. I'm wildly popular yet, but I think the, the at least the last time I saw um, sales data from the sex toy industry, um, it seems that they're on the rise. So there, there's been a lot of innovation, a lot of innovation um, mm -hmm. in terms of new products, new technologies, new materials, sizes, smells, colors, costs, um, and then the use Ooh. in that sense. And then yeah. all the way ramp up is things like sex robots and, and full size, you know, uh, sex doll. Um, so there's a lot of variation. I think people are trying to figure out exactly the, the you know, the client, the couple you described, how do we integrate this? Um, mm -hmm. People have been doing it. If you talk to couples that were long distance or where one partner travels for work, um, you know, having phone both... sex. I mean, before FaceTime, exactly. they were having phone sex. Exactly. Know? And those are people that, you know, I have a good friend, um, whose uh, husband travels for half the week and has their whole, and actually this is the first time they're together this much. The sort of their, their marriage was always based on the fact that they were, had spent half the week apart. Wow. And um, they had, they figured out how to make their sex life work for them. And, you know, in all sorts of ways, including traveling, videos, phones. Um, and I think there was a lot more of that happening than people realize. So any of your friends who have partners that travel or a long distance, they probably had something to keep the spice in their relationship. Absolutely. And, and, you know, just, and like technology, again, you, I have to reiterate what you said, it's becoming, it's become such an integral part that, I mean, literally I can order Starbucks just by swiping. And I think a lot of people also want to order their relationship, their man, their girlfriend in the same context. So I have to ask, Something that really comes to mind that I hear from a lot of clients and you're working with match.com, right? So you're, you're in there, you're seeing, and you're really seeing the data behind like what people are really interested. Is it true? Is everyone online just looking for a hookup? No, <laughs> no, it's not true. Thank I mean, you, because I don't believe that. I yeah. tell people that I think online dating is kind of like this this vehicle that we have to use. The thing is, it's like they give you a set of keys for a car and you've never known how to drive. And so you're kind of thrown to the wolves to, to figure out it. how it works. Yeah, yeah. And that's, I mean, when you think of it that way, it's pretty scary for everyone involved. In it. <laughs> and uh, you're absolutely right. I think so. We know that when we look at the data on online dating, that if it, it's the whole spectrum. It's some people looking for hookups, some people looking for casual relationships, some people looking for marriage. I mean, I think the promise of those technologies is something we need to think about. And sometimes people will download an app and say, I'm going to find my spouse. Right. And those of us who are kind of work in that uh, space and collect data, we always say, ah, no, you, these are technologies. They're, they're to get to meet people. And they can't promise you love. They can't promise you marriage. I think the ones that do, it's a false bill of sale, right? They can't, mm -hmm. they just can't. The data isn't there to promise that. Right. What they can do is help you find people with similar interests. You know, I'm really looking for someone I can play tennis with. Uh, that's a true story. But, you know, so, so. Ladies, you know, you're you're single, <laughs> let me know. I'll connect you to Dr. Justin. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So finding someone to play tennis with or someone who you want to travel with or someone you, um, you know, 
maybe sex is really important. And, and you can have these preferences, someone with the same cultural and ethnic background, what we call homogamy in, um, in relationship science. People often tend to be attracted to someone with similar life experiences. Mm -hmm. Same background, same religion, so the same socioeconomic. Although singles today are more open than any other generation of dating outside those areas. That the technologies help you find those people, but then you got to meet them. Then you have to do what you coach people on doing, on how to go on dates and how to have conversations, how to learn about each other. Then yeah. the human brain kicks in, right? Then the, the courtship mechanisms that have evolved over millions of years then kick in as we sort of get to know each other. Yeah. And, you know, as you're talking about that, I, I say to people, I'm a proponent of online dating apps and online dating websites. I, I tell people, you will probably, be, it seems like you have endless options, right? Which is a term that's used, the uh, paradox of choice. It seems like you just have endless options. And sometimes mm -hmm. people get this mentality of like, oh, well, what if there's something better out there, right? Mm -hmm. What? Oh my God, what happens if, if this person's great, but what if there's someone out there that meets everything that I'm looking for? And what I coach people on and what, I, what we talk to them as matchmakers, is like, look at this as an opportunity to be able to meet people that you possibly may have never met or that are walking down the street. And you probably, because you were too busy looking at your phone, you were distracted, you didn't really pay attention to who it is that was around you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I online dating is such a bad rap, but I, I try to really help people shift their mentality because you're right. Those that say, hey, listen, you're going to find the love of your life. You're going to find your partner. There is a possibility. We can't take that away yeah. because yeah, it, yeah. it's connecting you to someone. But it that promise, that's a really big promise. But what it does is that it opens the opportunity. And I think also, if you haven't dated for a long time, it's an opportunity for you to practice those conversational skills, get your keyboard skills, right? Yeah, absolutely. And you kind of get back into it. And you're you're right about the paradox of choice. And I one thing so many people struggle with is there's so many options. And um, even if you can kind of run out of your swipes and psychologically, that can be really hard. And one of my favorite studies, participants were given um, profiles, sort of fake profiles of six online daters versus 24. And the people who had six had an easier time choosing someone to go on a date with. And when they followed up, they were more happy with their choice than the people who had 24. Mm. Because the people who had 24 couldn't get out of their head, oh, maybe I should have gone with that one. Maybe I should have gone with that one. So it's why some of the apps now will give you like your top three for the day or say, you know, don't swipe for six hours. Go on and thoughtfully engage. Don't just swipe, read a profile. Think about going on a date with that person because you have to sort of trick your mind and your brain into really saying, not constantly saying, oh, there's a th I have a thousand other options on the app that I can run to because right. then you don't commit. You don't actually right. engage and you don't present. have the opportunity to learn. It's not present. That's the way to put it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're not present to the person in front of you. And I think I read a research study actually that says that our brain can only handle, I think the number was between five to nine. Yeah, it was five to nine interactions. Anything after that is exactly what you're describing. It's kind of like, you know, you, you just, your brain, I don't know if it shuts down or if it's, or it's that your brain just begins to look for other things. I, you know what I mean? But five to nine interactions. And I say to people, I'm like, you only need to meet one person, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you only need to meet that one person. So five to nine interactions, if you have five to nine dates a month from a dating app that are good quality, that you actually vet them out. I think that a lot of the dating experiences where people say that, oh my God, online dating sucks, or, you know, um, I'm never going to meet someone. There's no good men out there. There's no great women out there. Everybody just wants to hook up. I feel like that experience would change completely if people didn't feel that they would have to go on a buffet of dating, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. Right. That we can, you, there are those options, but partly it's, it's the uh, complexity of the, of sort of these technologies that we have an opportunity it's an endless opportunity but we have to make sure that the endless opportunity doesn't get interpreted as endless options right that it's really there to sort of find people that that interest you that excite you and then you got to go on the dates you have to go on dates we know for instance that first dates are important we know that second dates are really important in our data um, in one of our studies over 70 percent of participants uh, singles in our single study um, said that they had become uh, deeply attracted to someone that they weren't initially attracted to by getting to know them talking to them learning more about them seeing them in real life hearing them smelling them talking to them over 30% fell deeply in love with someone that they didn't initially think they could. 
Um, so those interactions matter, really getting to know someone and, and be present, as you put it. So based on that, it sounds like chemistry doesn't always happen instantly, right? Mm -hmm. Chemistry can actually form over a period of time. Absolutely. And one question that has, um, you know, uh, haunted scientists for decades, particularly in this space and sex and relationships is how can we predict that chemistry? How can you, how can we really know if two people are going to have it? Um, you guys would be well, billionaires if that's the truth. If we were exactly. able to figure that out, <laughs> that's the truth. I say that to my clients too. I'm like, as a matchmaker, I will introduce you to quality individuals. But I cannot manufacture chemistry. If I did, I'd be a bajillionaire and I'd sell it in a love potion number nine bottle. I, I'd buy, we'd buy it for everyone. <laughs> and um, exactly. And we don't know the science and, and people have tried and they've used really wonderful statistical techniques and different research designs. It's there's too much going on, right? There's too much um, interact, the, those interactive effects. I like to think of relationships as it's two fingerprints. And every person is unique in their each way. And every time you meet someone, you smush up against a, a, another fingerprint. And every person is a little bit different in that sense. And, and it's actually one of the problems sometimes people have when they end a relationship, they kind of look to repeat. Now, there are certain things maybe you really like that you want to repeat, but, but you'll never get the exact same thing with someone else. You won't even get the same thing if you date an ex because you've changed and life has changed. And, the, and, and that new fingerprint is going to be a little bit different. And, so we know um, we know that people have those options, but really trying to get them to um, think about each new person as you know, get to know them and think about uh, uh, interacting with them. You know? Yeah. Well, um, I know you guys are doing some really great work out at the Kinsey Institute. Can you tell us? Can you share what's on the cutting edge? I mean, now post pandemic. Um, what, what's on the cutting edge when it comes to dating? I'm really curious. I think all of us in the love industry, matchmakers, dating coaches, you know, we're kind of curious to see what trends are going to stick from the pandemic. But there, we're, we're also curious to know what emerging trends could we potentially be on the lookout for? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm convinced that the video dating is going to stay, uh, and I th I think that's a good thing. I think it's a new step in the a stage in the courtship process for the reasons you know we were saying that you you get to know someone. It's a, it's a little bit less stress. It's a little bit less money. It's a little bit less time, but it's more than just texting. So I I'm convinced that's here, and I think we should encourage it to people that say, okay, well let's let's do a video date, and then you plan. Because first dates are awkward, right? We know that. You and I are in this space. We know that people, everyone, I love when someone says to me like, well, I went on a first date and it was so awkward. And I always think like you and everyone else, like <laughs> that's, <laughs> they are. Cause you're kind of nervous. You're getting to know someone. You're learning a rhythm of speech. You're uh, in your head. Person. You're saying your own story and you're trying yeah, to be my, perfect. Yeah, am I being judged on what I want? I really want a salad. Maybe I should get a burger. What does that yeah. say about me? <laughs> you know, there's all those things. Um, and uh, I think the video date helps break that down a little bit. You can kind of more, it gets closer, you kind of build a friendship. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that's interesting. So when we look at the demographic data, there's there's all sorts of interesting trends going on. One in four singles, for instance, had sex with a non-romantic roommate during the pandemic, 24%. So people are um, turning to partners that maybe perhaps they hadn't thought of before. Mm -hmm. But I think what's happening um, and I'm, I'm really curious to see how this plays out. I'll be curious what you see also with your clients, that um, people are prioritizing the friendship aspect of relationships and dating more. Because because we've had all this time, like we're texting for six months or video chatting, or you're, you know, we don't interact as much as we don't both have our vaccines. So we're building the base of relationships. Now, from my perspective as a sex and relationship scientist, those relationships are going to be more stable. Um, that's what you want. You want to build those friendship bases in relationships that someone you actually really like to be around, you care about them, you have empathy for them. Um, I'm curious how that's going to play out. I suspect I suspect what's going to happen in the next few months is we're going to see a spike in divorce. We're going to see also a spike in marriage. Both are going to increase because people have been waiting to sort of just follow up on paperwork or do things. I'm so many friends who are engaged who are just waiting kind of to do the marriage, right? And yeah. Um, so I think we'll see those spikes initially. And then long term, over six months, 12 months, five years, I think there's been a little bit of a return of uh, people thoughtfully dating. I think we're kind of oh, getting out of the kind of, people aren't going to stop having casual sex. They've been doing it for decades. They're going right. to continue for decades. But I think that there's going to be when people really want relationships, 
they're going to do it a little bit more thoughtfully, thinking about building relationships and connections with people, getting to know those partners. I'm convinced it's a dating renaissance. I think that this is going to, I think that our roaring 20s is going to be about meaningful connections. Ooh, I love that dating renaissance. You know what? I couldn't agree with you more. And part of the reason is the way that I look at it. I think back when I was dating in my 20s, right? Online dating was around, but it was, it had this taboo, right? Where it's like, oh, if you're online dating, you must be desperate. Like, you can't meet someone normal. So I remember that online dating existed. But one thing that I do remember is that when you would date and technology wasn't so integral in our life, when you were dating, that's exactly what you were doing is you were able to build a friendship, right? Because you didn't have this thought in your mind that, oh, well, if this doesn't work out, I'm just gonna go ahead, pop into match, you know, go ahead and see if there's someone else that I can go on a date with, right? I think people, took it a little bit slower. As a matter of fact, 2021 is supposed to be the year of slow dating and exactly what you're saying, building those relationships, having more meaningful and deep conversation. And I know that research provided by the Gottman Institute actually tells us that friendship it is foundational to, to a relationship surviving the long term. Why? Because when you build a friendship, you feel safe, you have trust, and you also learn so much more about one another and you keep an open mind about your partner as time moves on. We change as individuals. I'm married. I've been with my husband now for, well, 11 years, but it'll be eight years that we've been married. And I can't tell you, I'm not the same Michelle when he first met me and he's not the same Leo when I first met him, but it's been, we started out as friends. And as our friendship has grown and we've been able to really get to know one another, it's also provided that opportunity for me to be able to accept that he's not going to be the same. And it's made me more curious about him as a partner, to be honest with you. Yeah, I love that. I mean, that's, and I, as a scientist, you know, I'm hearing all the signs of passion, 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 <laughs> and that excitement of being curious about our partners, about growing together. Um, uh, my friend and colleague, Esther Perel says this, right? That if you want to be with someone for years, um, you have to be willing to, your relationships change and your marriage when you start versus if you have kids versus later in life, our bodies change, our priorities change, what we know about each other change, our excitements about that partner, our letdowns with that partner. All of those things um, go into the mix, uh, but that's part of the adventure. If you're committed to being with that person, that's that's part of the, uh, which some people aren't. And I think we also have to destigmatize um, sometimes relationships end and that doesn't mean i i really hate when people say oh that relationship failed that marriage failed yeah. it wasn't successful mm -hmm. and i think well just because it ended doesn't mean it wasn't successful um right. it could have been a great run right mm -hmm. but um you're at different stages in your lives and looking for something different so i mean some relationships do you know go out and some a, people should just never place. get together let's just be exactly honest. i mean and then some people it's just they grew apart Exactly. And I think that we have to um, do a better job of accepting that and not treating it as a as a failure or a problem. Or a scarlet letter, like, oh, you have the scarlet letter D, divorced, you know, yeah. unwanted and all these other things. But I think I agree with you. I hope that that does become destigmatized. Tell me, where can people learn more about you? Follow your research on social media. I know that you and I are on Clubhouse. We moderate some rooms together. But yeah. if people want to know more about you and the Kinsey Institute, where can they get some more information? Yeah, thanks. So the people are welcome to follow me on social media. So it's Dr. Justin Garcia on Instagram and Twitter. Um, and then, and when we're on Clubhouse uh, with some of our friends, and then uh, also the Kinsey Institute. So go to the Kinsey Institute website, uh, follow the Kinsey Institute on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, we're everywhere. Um, and we'll post often about our new studies. We've got a brilliant team of faculty and researchers working on all sorts of issues related to sex, sexuality, gender relationships, uh, reproduction. Um, so we'll post our, our academic studies. We have an education program. People can sign up for our summer institute and get a certificate in sexuality. Um, so uh, follow us and you uh, can hopefully folks can learn a little bit more about what we're doing and how we're trying to really use science to understand the human condition and, and make the world a better place. Oh, I love it. That's why I brought you on, Dr. Justin, because our motto is changing the world one relationship at a time. Yes, I love it. Yes, thank you so much for being here, spending this time with me. I always love the conversations that we have. I know that you've given yeah. some really great golden nuggets to everyone that is watching. And don't forget to follow the Kinsey Institute. Stay up to date. The more resources and tools that you have in your tool belt, guess what? The more successful and the closer you're going to get to finding love. Thanks so much, Dr. Justin.
Thanks. Love it. Good to see you. See ya.